someone asks you to name one traditional Chinese clothing, you would probably say qiongzam or qipao. But here's the thing, qipao is anything but traditional. It only came into fashion around the mid-1920s. At that time, it was considered a very modern garment representing a big step forward in terms of gender equality because for the first time, women could wear the same one-piece robe that was only allowed to men before. For the thousands of years before that, Chinese women in general only wore two-piece garments, a jacket or blouse for the top, a skirt or a pair of trousers for the bottom. The only exception was the banner garment, or qizhuang, worn by the Manchurian during the Qing dynasty, but it was only reserved for the Manchu women who were considered more superior in social status. The majority of the population, which was the Han Chinese women, was still wearing a variation of the traditional two-piece outfit. Here's what Han women wore during the late Qing dynasty. The typical outfit consists of a long and baggy jacket blouse, a pleated skirt or trousers, and tiny shoes for the bound feet. The garment can be made quite plain, but fancy ones for wealthy ladies often have layers and layers of elaborately decorated trim. Following the 1912 Xinhai Revolution and the establishment of the Republic of China, much effort was made to reform the way people dressed. Women's clothing became narrower and simpler, and the practice of foot binding was basically banned and frowned upon. Two key events happened in the 1910s. In 1915, scholars and intellectuals started the New Culture Movement, which aimed at promoting science and democracy over traditional Confucian value. Four years later, the Treaty of Versailles gave the German rights of Shandong province to Japan. This unequal treaty led to the May 4th Movement of 1919, a nationwide patriotic protest led mostly by students. This period marks a significant turning point in Chinese history. Many progressive young people who called themselves the new youth started to see themselves as pioneers that could lead China out of poverty and into the modern world. They embraced new political ideology, they studied science and technology, they supported feminism, and they wanted individuality for themselves. And clothing became an essential tool for them to visualize this kind of breaking away from traditional value system. It was within this kind of political and cultural context that a new style of women's clothing emerged. It is called civilized new look or women xinzhuang in Chinese. It is sometimes directly referred to as the May 4 style by some Western scholars because of its tight connection with the movement. Women Xinjiang was first popularized by female students who would wear simple blue tops, black skirts, white stockings, and leather shoes. But very quickly, this new look took over women's fashion across the board and became the dominant fashion trend until qipao gained its popularity in the late 20s and early 30s. The jacket blouse became a lot more fitted and much shorter, very often ending right above the hips. Sleeves shortened and became white at the bottom. Much like the 1920s style in the West, skirt hem gradually raised and exposed the ankle and the calf. The mandarin collar became lower to allow for more movement, and in some cases even disappeared completely. The black cotton skirt of the students also evolved into a fancier silk version, often decorated with trimming and beading. It entered many young women's wardrobe in the 20s and eventually became an iconic piece of the period. In an attempt to recreate a classic black skirt, I borrowed a vintage 20s skirt from my friend's vintage Xiangzan store, Man Li. This skirt is made of plain black charmeuse and has a roll of embroidered flower trim down at the bottom, which is typical to many skirts of the period. I bought a similar heavyweight silk charmeuse. For some reason, the black and white charmeuse are twice as expensive as all the colored ones, so I bought the darkest brown I could find. Let's just all pretend that it's black. I came to realize that it's quite difficult even in China to find a floral trim as elaborate as those made in the 20s. Surprisingly, after hours of searching, I finally settled on this 7cm wide trim from an Etsy store in Spain. The first step is to fold the fabric in half salvage to salvage. The side seam of this vintage skirt was backstitched by hand, which is one of the most common stitches used in closing seams. The fabric is so dark that even with three lights pointed at it, I still couldn't see very well. Also, just a heads up, most of the footage are just one big chunk of boring black fabric, so please bear with me on this one. 
At one point, I realized that on Western clothing, seam allowance are generally pressed open, while on Chinese clothing, they are usually pressed to one side. This is a result of the different method used by the dressmakers. Instead of using an iron to press open the seam allowance to either side, in traditional Chinese cloth making, people use this method called da shui xin, which literally translates as marking the water line. Take a strand of thick cotton yarn, wet it with your lips, and press it onto the fold line. This marks a thin wet line on the fabric, which makes it a lot easier to fold the fabric, especially when it's flimsy. Fold both layers of seam allowance towards one end and iron it. Turn the fabric onto the right side and iron it again. I put an extra piece of fabric on top so that the heat doesn't accidentally damage the delicate silk shirt moves. And there you have a very nicely finished side seam. The hem of this 20th skirt was finished with a neat slip stitch, and then the trim was applied using a running stitch. I drew a 5cm seam allowance and a 1cm one down at the bottom. Here again I used the marking the waterline technique to fold the seam allowance. You might be wondering why go through the unhygienic process and drain your own saliva when you can just run the yarn through some water. This is the most fascinating part about this technique. Basically, the enzyme in human saliva breaks down the starch in the fabric, creating a very crisp edge once it's ironed down. It doesn't make that much of a difference on this particular fabric, since there's probably little to no carbohydrate in there, but you can still see just how sharp this edge is from that thin water line. It's finally time to add some color onto the skirt. I paint the floral trim just a little bit above the hem. At the connecting point, I carefully trim down the edges so that the overlapped part still looks like one piece. Tack this part down with a couple stitches. And then do a running stitch at the top and bottom of the trim. The stitch on the front should be as invisible as possible, but the stitch lengths on the back can be 1 to 2 cm long. The waist is simply gathered with an elastic band. Again, mark the waterline and fold in the seam allowance. Depending on the year and the style, a 1920s skirt can reach down to the ankle or just below the knees. The one I'm making is 80 cm long, but that's just my own preference. I slip stitched along the waistband and left a 5 cm wide opening for the elastic band. Pin a safety pin onto the waistband and guide it through the channel. Use a small back stitch to securely attach the two ends together. Then slip stitch close the 5cm opening. 
and the skirt is done. Thank you all for watching this video. I hope you've learned some more about Chinese clothing history and the special technique involved in the dressmaking process. I am now starting to construct the white sleeved jacket blouse that goes with this skirt, so stay tuned for my next video.